Center of America in its natural form uh, by the year 2030. And the purpose for that is, is to combat uh, climate change and to help preserve species, reducing species at just such an unprecedented rate, uh, largely because our own large human population just keeps growing exponentially. And so we need to find ways to help wildlife survive, and that's what this program is about, why? And so I will cover wilderness for recreation, wilderness for science, and wilderness for wildlife. In the very beginning of the San Antonio Almanac in the preface, elderly folks, do we need these other lights on back there or not? It should show up there if we don't need them on. Yes, we need those other lights on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so uh, in his preface, he states like winds and sunsets, wild things were taken for granted until progress began to do away with them. Now we face the question whether a still higher standard of living is worth its cost in things natural, wild and free. For us in the minority, the opportunity to see these is more important than television. And the chance to find a past life is a right as inalienable as free speech. In just a tidbit of history, back in early century years, they thought the Canada goose was about to go extinct. And there was a major effort, largely by many of the honey goose, to protect wetlands that were essential and start movements to help the candy bees reproduce and be successful in reproduction. And so uh, that's why he says uh, what he said about the Canada geese being more important than television. Now, many authors have written about nature in one way or another. And uh, Robert Frost has his famous poem, Stop by Woods and Snow Eden. He says, Whose woods these are? I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He won't ask me to stop in here to watch his woods or watch the snow. Now, there were horses in the queer. It's a stack without a firehouse near it. Between the woods, frozen lake, the dark sea in the sea. He gives his heart a spell as a shape. Ask, is there some mistake? Yes, it's hard to make out the words. It says a speak. Down in flake. The woods are lovely. They're dark and deep. But I have promises to keep. And miles to go before I sleep. I encourage each of you to take some time to stop by the woods. Take some time to venture off to wilderness areas. And that's not an easy travel. So we'll just talk about wild areas versus wilderness areas. But hopefully you will take the time and as Audubon members <laughs> that are ready and become more familiar with all the wonderful things that surround us. My own writing, look, I cannot say I'm educated because I know plants in the wild. When I know them on friendly terms, I will not need to say I'm educated. For the wise will know, and others, well, they won't pay them. But when we're talking about Protecting the future, 30% uh, of natural land protected in some means by the year 2030. We're looking at conservation. Edward Pinchot, over a century ago, had a definition for conservation where he said conservation is the foresighted utilization of our forest, of our waters, of our lands and minerals for the greatest good of the greatest number for the longest time. Now, I am pretty confident that the fellow or different Pinchot was thinking pretty much solely in the minds of people, the greatest good of the greatest number of people. I'm a little broader than that in my vision in terms of thinking that includes the monarch and that includes the butterfly leaf and all the things that support the earth that support us, the greatest good for the greatest number for the longest time. And we want it to be the longest time. These little girls are now about 40 years old. <laughs> and we want their kids. We have grandchildren, three of them. 
Uh, the little girl on the right has been a son, four years old. The daughter on the left has a two and a half year old and a 10 month old daughter. And so uh, we want those kids and their kids and their great great grandkids to have a healthy world that supports them. And you can't have that if you don't protect the natural world that supports us. Now, uh, Leopold also said, um, the rich, the, 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 <laughs> uh, the richest God, the richest God is foolish, and not in the case of Daniel Willow, nor even in the present. The richest values of wilderness lie in the future. I was just talking about. Great, 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 great grandkids, a thousand times four. And so we're going to be talking about wilderness extends mostly in the southwest, probably scattering across the entire continent. And we're going to be looking at the Red Dot Country, the extends from Rice Canyon National Park. And we're going to look at wilderness for recreation. We're going to look at wilderness for science. And that is among the most important for people. And we're going to look at wilderness for wildlife. And we can't have wildlife if we destroy everything, but we also can't have a healthy population of people if we don't utilize land. So we need to find that balance where we can treat lands, perhaps with pesticides, perhaps with different things, that we need to support our own population, but we can set aside the red rock wilderness and many other areas that are going to be essential for the future, including wildlife. Wilderness for wildlife. When I speak wildlife, I'm talking about things like you know, all these natural things, the benefits we're talking about later, some of these organisms, the sagebrush uh, in the southwest, the ridges that you have to hike into. Right? So it's like 10 mile hike for me to get back to this lake uh, from the nearest place you could bring me. And getting back into places like this, I hope I can share with you tonight. I don't think I can, but at least I can give you an inkling as to some of the joys, experiences of wilderness that we really have to work to get into. So wilderness, natural areas, we want to protect. Here in our Great Lakes region, we have some areas like the Porcupine Mountain State Park, and we've got these extensive areas where we can preserve the health of wildlife and the plants and animals. We've lost the great pioneers that we had in the 1700s, in the 1800s, they were pretty much clear cut and then burned, and a lot was wasted. We've learned better practices. We have remnants like the Hubbard Pine State Park, or up at Estevan Pines, the Keemanau Peninsula, but just in the 1800s, and not large wilderness areas represent what it was. Free flowing streams and rivers. Well, we're not going to find the Grand River in the condition that it was a few hundred years ago. But some of our smaller streams may still maintain that natural character and the species that were once there. And we're making efforts with the Grand River, which we'll talk about too, to replenish some of the more naturalness of that area. So we'll look at the wilderness in a number of ways tonight, and we'll talk about the wild areas. Uh, looking to this area to the south in Bryce Canyon National Park, which we're standing here at one of the higher elevations, way in the distance. You see the Kayabab Plateau that the Grand Canyon cuts through. Can't see the Colorado River, it's 5,000 feet down in that. <laughs> but uh, this area uh, is 80 miles north to south, which you view there, and over 100 miles from east to west. And this is the Red Rock Wilderness Country that we're talking about. And we actually have a meeting tomorrow. And if anybody wants to join, I think you can do that. You can contact me. We're going to have a phone conversation with people uh, to talk about. Uh, trying to get Peter Meyer uh, to sign on to uh, supporting the legislation for the Red Rock Wilderness. But this wonderful area is relatively desolate. You'll see some areas that look like they're kind of open, and they are. And some of the areas around the wilderness area are fairly heavily utilized. 
People want to turn that whole area that you see in the foreground into a coal mine. So when you go out to this highest point of Bryce Canyon National Park, you'll just see a large strip mine. They've been working on that for 40 some years, much longer than that. I know about 40 years. We've managed to hold it off. If we can get some of this land protected, it will be there for future generations. So looking to the south, you also notice the air here. Air quality has declined. And a ranger came to the National Park in the 1970s, and they went there as a ranger in the 1930s. And he stuffed a lot of birds, and I stuffed birds. So it was really a pleasure to meet him because I used the birds he stuffed in my programs. And we were talking, he said, what happened to the air? And I thought, no, you know, I didn't say this to him, but you're, you're, you're in your mid eighties, perhaps your eyes aren't what they were. Well, I've seen a continuous decline in air quality in the years since then. And so we see this haze that's continuously in now, and we're doing air quality work. We started out doing it with scopes and people would monitor things, but now it's all computerized, so you don't get the variability from person to person or whatever. And a lot of the reasons are things like this Prowitz power plant, which I can't recall without looking it up now. It's less than 1% of the particulate matter comes out, or maybe less than 3%. The rest is scrubbed out. But there's so much coming out that it just causes a major haze over that entire area, uh, 100 miles wide, 80 miles north south. And it affects the, the life of everything there, as well as the enjoyment that people have trying to get the natural beauty and clarity of that area. Wilderness is something that's different than a thousand foot lineup of cars waiting to get into a national park. It's not something like a thousand people sitting to watch something free, natural, and wild, like old faith. Those are wild experiences. They're free, they're natural, they're wild, but they're not the wilderness experience. And so I'm going to be talking largely about the wilderness experience when we get off, either in small groups or by yourself. I tend to be a solo hiker. Um, take my compass, and my wife will drop me off somewhere and then disappear. She hopes I come back. And uh, I wander off, uh, sometimes just using a compass where there's no trails, sometimes I call it trails. But getting into a wilderness is a very different experience. And I remember hiking in from the Waterton District in Canada uh, through Glacier National Park, probably about 12 miles from the nearest road. And I came upon a bear track in the mud along a creek. If for some reason I were killed by a bear in the wilderness, I did not want that bear hunted down and killed. I'm a visitor in its home, and I need to be taking the precautions I need to protect myself. And so far, at age 71, I'm still here. I've managed to do so. We did have a problem with Bryce Canyon National Park with a black bear that was raiding backpackers in the backcountry, taking their packs and turning them apart and chasing them away. And the rangers went down and attacked them and shot and killed them. Now, that, uh, was essential because that particular bear was a problem there and it wasn't wilderness, it was back country, but uh, he would, he just got so brave that he was coming in. But even hanging your uh, backpack in the tree at night isn't always safe. I mean, I do that, but bears have figured out ways to get up and bring branches down to get your backpack or whatever. But if you go into a wilderness, you need a little different mindset. It's not something like being on a board Walk safe at some place like the Hot Springs at Yellowstone National Park, where you're not going to break through a thin layer of uh, crust on the hot springs and get scolded to death, which happens to people. But here you can do it very safe, but still see something free, natural, and wild. But when I was backpacking, I took my compass and I just headed across country at Yellowstone. And I came upon this uh, river, and this doe was paying pretty good attention to me. And then she lost interest. She kept looking the other way. I don't know if there was a grizzly there or what. She knew there was something there that was much more important than me. And that's part of the wilderness experience, too. You realize you are not a prominent thing. You are just a little piece of the puzzle that's no more important than the deer fly here. And if a bear killed me, as I mentioned, or here we got a crab spider catching the deer fly, you know, when you give up the comfort and uh, safety of things like boardwalks at Yellowstone or some of those places, 
you're putting yourself at risk. You try to do it properly. You try to do it in a way that's going to keep you safe. Uh, we always hear about people that for one reason or another don't make it uh, either because of an accident or some mistake they made or whatever. But, uh, you know, I like to think of myself in the wilderness as no more significant than the fly there. But with our family, we get to the edges of wilderness areas. We haven't gotten way, way back. They ever taken my hikes with my youngest daughter. She said, I'm not going any farther. <laughs> she just sat and enjoyed it. We got to watch a weasel that came while we went on. Uh, she got to uh, experience wonderful things at home. But we go up to these wilderness areas or the edge of wilderness and watch the waves roll in like Lake Superior and talk about the waves and the rocks and just enjoy it. And then we start throwing rocks and say, who can hit the white cap? This is wonderful family time. Time to build relationships. And I think we've been successful, I hope so, in giving our daughters the appreciation for the natural world that's all around us. As I mentioned, wilderness is something different than a thousand foot lineup of cars, or it's different than travel trailer or cattle ranch. Cattle change the environment so dramatically we lose a lot of native species. So by having wilderness areas, we can protect some of those. And then Karen and I hiked into quite remote areas. I was talking to somebody before the program, I forget who now, about the wave. And it's a 10 mile hike back to the wave. And it's not easy. And the, the trail isn't easily marked. You can see walking down here, there's no place to put a trail. They just put little Karens or they tell you the direction, go that way. And so we wandered back. Uh, so you see Karen there and among the waves in this beautiful country. So we've hiked there a few times. Not for us anymore, probably. There comes a point when you can't do that. But wilderness for recreation, very important value. And our Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance and the Utah Coalition of Wilderness, Wilderness Coalition are people that are working to preserve this area. And many of them, I think their focus might be primarily recreation. <laughs> We need to keep in mind there's more to it than recreation. There's wilderness for science, there's wilderness for wildlife. And we need to protect those. And so these people are my age. Uh, so you can guess that it's an older picture. But here they are experiencing something that just is absolutely superb. Now, the Forest Service has set aside what they might consider their comparable wilderness. They've got about two and a half acres here fenced in. And so if something goes wrong with that area that's fenced in, or the area outside the fence, they can compare it to the area that's inside the fence to say how to bring it back to healthy condition. What's interesting is half of that area was received with European grasses, exotic species, and the other half is of natural. And then the cow you see on the far left has gotten through the fence and is raising in there. So here's a two and a half acre piece of land with European grasses considered to be natural to replenish an area if we make mistakes. Well, you can't preserve species on two and a half acres. And you need to have a large area. And then if you look at the foreground, when you can see that much bare dirt in a relatively arid region, it's not healthy grazing. That's being overgrazed. And so their exposure isn't doing its job. And though they consider this healthy grazed land, well, I don't. Another area closer to home, this is in Minnesota actually, but uh, people find ways to circumvent the laws. So the farmer here, he farms this area in the background, looks like it's bare. He farms it every year, it floods out every year. He loses his crop, the government comes in with subsidies to pay him for what he lost. The county comes in every year and redates the eight foot deep ditch that these three people in the foreground are standing in. That's all filled in with soil that's washed out and going down and filling in streams. And so the farmer gets money by farming land that is not good for farming, that floods out every year. The government pays them with subsidies and the county comes in and pays to redig the ditch. It's one way to get around the law and still make money by farming lands that shouldn't be farmed. And there's many ways that we see that happening. And so if we have wilderness areas, but we don't have people going in and manipulating the land, we can protect them. 
that this area is being theoretically protected, just like the Forest Service was protecting that area that it showed them a big slot, and they're not being protected. So wilderness areas are absolutely critical. And this eight and a half million acres that we're talking about specifically tonight, the Red Rock Wilderness of Southern Utah, very fragile, is extremely important to the survival of many wildlife. Wilderness for science. We can gain things that surprise us. People will say, well, what does it matter if a snail goes extinct? Well, I found that some of the chemicals in the snail help agglutinate chemicals in the lungs of people out of asthma and save their lungs. But if the snail goes extinct and you don't find those chemicals, you've lost the cure. Maybe the cure for COVID, maybe the cure for some disease we've never heard of yet is going to show up and we're going to find the cure in some species that we preserve that's living free and wild and natural in the wilderness area. We need areas like this. If we turn the entire earth back into a wilderness area, most of us would die very quickly. And so I understand that we need to have areas where we have crops, that we do things to maintain ourselves, but we also can't survive into the future if we don't protect the wilderness areas. If we make mistakes and we go in and harvest trees on slopes that are too steep, and you see here the house, and you see that land where the soil is washing into the river and uh, killing the fish and causing problems, we can figure out what a healthy land should be like if we have locals to prepare them with and maybe bring them back. Here in Michigan, up in the Upper Peninsula, we harvested trees. This is over a century ago, and it still has not recovered. We didn't use good forestry practices. We didn't even know some of the good forestry practices back then. We know better. And we know ways that we can help manage the forest. We can go in and harvest trees and utilize them to build our homes, do whatever we need, to have the furniture. But we don't need to devastate the areas and find that after 120 years, they're still not recovered. Cougar Hollow, which is the national forest just outside the national park, was clear cut in 1961. 1962, they came in and planted the trees you see in, behind the sign there. And you see the sign there, it says by the year 2000, they're gonna harvest those trees. They got a better genetic variety, they can grow faster. Well, Congress passed a law that says, don't cut trees faster than you can grow them. So the Forest Service, unknowingly, though they knew, uh, said these trees are going to be harvestable in 30 years, 40, 38 years. Well, I knew they weren't. Uh, I was there in the mid-70s. I knew those trees were not going to be anywhere near harvestable uh, by the year 2000. And so uh, as the year 2000 approached, and you see the background there doesn't show up as well here, these trees aren't taller than me. And that's when they're supposed to harvest them. So they recalculated, went in and rerouted the sides, and now we'll harvest those trees in the year 2030. I know that's not going to happen. It's about a 200 year period before those trees are ready to harvest. But in the meantime, they can over harvest and cut trees faster than they can be grown. And if they get chosen, like, oh, we made a mistake. They're growing as fast as we thought we we're going to do. We'll fix it. We'll change the date again. So these are problems to circumvent the laws. And organizations like Audubon and Sierra Club and the Michigan Botanical Club and others are working on great efforts to try to stop things like this where people are deliberately circumventing the law and finding ways to get around it so they can get what they want. And if we do make mistakes, we can go back and correct them. Many people don't want things like prairie dogs. A cow could uh, theoretically break a leg, and I wouldn't doubt if one did. Not very common. I would doubt that it happened stepping into uh, an endangered species uh, Utah prairie dog hole. But people want the prairie dogs yet, and they pretty much wiped them out. Fortunately, they've been listed as federally endangered. They're now protected, and there's efforts to help bring them back in some areas. On private land, well, they're still persecuted. Uh, but anyhow, hopefully, we can protect the species. And if we have some wilderness areas that meet their living requirements, they can survive, which won't happen on a lot of private lands. Public lands actually are something that we need to work to preserve 
and we need to find ways to make them actually work so that the laws are uncertain that other areas, which I'm not going to get into in detail tonight, things like the tropical rainforest, have just such an abundance of species. They've gone in and they fogged some trees with uh, chemicals to cause the insects and things to fall down on the sheets underneath. And they always find just a, a tremendous number of new species that have never been described. And they go to another nearby area and find the same thing. There are so many kinds of wildlife on the earth we know nothing about, and whether they have the cure for COVID or uh, chest asthma or whatever it is, if we lose those, we lose the potential of what they can do to help us. So that's the focus of most people. What can we get from this that's going to help people? And we, of course, want more than for recreation. We also want them to the wildlife themselves, a place in creation, where they can live fully natural and wild without interference from humans. Okay, time to change my carousel. Can you change my carousel for me? Thank you, Gus. Push that center. You got to turn it to zero and then that'll lift right off. Uh, you have to push that. There's a little lever in the middle right there. Now just push the lever on the, on the outside. Oh, oh. Push that down and then turn that to zero and then it'll lift off. Okay. Old fashioned equipment store, my Mary Jane Doctor, we all miss her greatly. And her projector, she put the slides in one at a time. And, uh, one of my colleagues from Hard Christians Nature said, this is old technology. Well, it is, but it still works. Just like Mary Jane's system worked. <laughs> All right, so wilderness for wildlife. When I talk about wildlife, things like the sugar maple tree, this little uh, tree just started to come up. Wildlife like the geese that we talked about earlier, the places where they can live free. But we usurp much of the habitat. We use those for sunning beaches, for enjoying, and taking them away from wildlife. Fortunately, we've got groups like the Land Conservancy of West Michigan that is doing just tremendous things to preserve many of the dune areas along Lake Michigan and uh, providing places where things like the piping plover uh, can reproduce. And so hopefully we will be successful. Uh, the question arises, why is it essential and necessary for us to have fish hatcheries in order for them to maintain their populations? Why can't fish survive on their own without our help? And part of the answer to that is because we don't have enough natural areas protected where they can go about living their lives in the way they used to for century upon century upon century without our influence. We don't need to necessarily have an overwhelming negative influence on the world around us. Some of the causes might be things like here. So there's an effort now in the Grand River to get rid of these dams so fish can migrate upstream. And they have their issues too. What about the lamprey, the species that now will be able to go up there too? Then we have to treat the side streams so that the lamprey can't survive. But the fish will also be able to get up there and reproduce like they once did. We've had mitigation studies so the fish can survive and we have the fish ladder. But again, that's an artificial thing that we've had to do to help them survive. And that fish ladder is very useful, but it's not a substitute for free, wild, and natural. Things like Glen Canyon Dam and the Colorado River has greatly changed the whole ecology of the Grand River. For many people, this is the closest that we're going to get to wilderness. Walking on a warm spring day without your shirt, just soaking in the sun and relishing in it and how wonderful this is. That's fine. The wilderness isn't for everybody, but the natural world is. And the natural world is for us to enjoy the sun, to enjoy the weather, and to enjoy the benefits that come from wilderness areas. 
we can find ways to live. I mean, this seems so controversial, I and mean, I just don't understand why people don't want to switch to renewable energies when we know alternative energies are ecologically more sound, not without problems, because are they going to kill more birds when you have windmills out in the Great Lakes or migratory routes? We got they got to be planned properly and placed properly. But we can also do things like have solar panels on our homes, have earth burned homes and build in a way that's going to conserve energy. We can turn to alternative energies and become active in the climate accord. So our future does not look like this. That's happened too often. But we've mismanaged the land in such a way that we've lost our livelihood. We want wilderness for our uses, for recreation, and for wildlife. Wildlife of all types, big and small. The parish primrose. And here's a flower, relatively rare, that has its place in the world as much as you and I do. Most of us have probably become aware in the last 40 years of the discovery of a chemical from the Pacific U that has saved many women from ovarian cancer. And if this plant, which was endangered and still is not, I don't think, thriving, but it's uh, protected now as an endangered species, we found chemicals in there that were able to save women from ovarian cancer. If we let this go extinct and got rid of the wild lands where they live, we would also possibly lose this potential that uh, can save the lives. And how many untold diseases that aren't even known yet will be saved by the chemicals that are in organisms. Chemicals from things like the rattlesnake. We've heard of the poison dart uh, frog. Well, this isn't a poison dart. It's a great uh, basin toad. But who knows what those contain that might be important to us. Things like the cicada or other insects, unknown riches. We already have caused prairie bison or the plains bison to go extinct that no longer exist. The larger subspecies, the major one that existed in the Great Plains, what we did is we found a small number of mountain bison that survived and we've taken those and bred them and now all we have is this particular subspecies of mountain bison. But we have all kinds of species of different varieties. The peregrine falcon that lived in the eastern United States is gone forever. There will never, ever be a peregrine falcon like it lived here 80 years ago. The genetic variety has become extinct. We again found a subspecies that we brought in, and uh, somebody's talking about John. Um, help me out. Will. John Will, who was so instrumental in the Peregrine Falcon reintroduction. Uh, earlier tonight, we were talking about that. And when we helped bring those in, and I had the wonderful opportunity to work in Minnesota with the reintroduction of Peregrine Falcons. And when I moved here, got involved with Greg Peterson, who's here in the room somewhere, uh, who was real instrumental in helping bring back the Peregrine Falcon to Grand Rapids. And so we've done things, but we didn't bring back the original subspecies. We brought back another one. And so like the bison, uh, we don't have the full variety of genetics that there once was. And that's why woven shutters are so critical to preserve a little bit of every type of habitat as wilderness across the entire continent and world, where things can happen like three, four rivers that can maintain populations. Large wildlife like the moose can maintain their own populations. And even important things like the leaf miners can go about their business. In your front yard, you might not want this. It's probably no more damaging than um, a mass of mosquitoes are to us on a bad day, but these don't kill the tree. And so they can go about living and in wilderness areas. They're not even going to be persecuted like they would be in our yard, perhaps. Things like the Lorquins Admiral, wilderness for wildlife. I'd love to share the experience with you of the trumpeter swan. Again, using my compass, I was just hiking cross country at Yellowstone, came upon this wetland that was not on the map, and here were some trumpeter swans. This was in the 1970s, when trumpeter swans were extremely rare and still thought possibly the most. 
We've been very successful in our efforts to help bring back the uh, Trump and Schwabs. And I can share with you a pretty picture, but I cannot share with you the experience. I found hiking cross country with the compass and just coming upon them. Things like the tiger swallowtail. These are wonderful forms of wildlife that enrich our lives in ways that are unknown. So I was out doing botanical research with Dr. Tony Resnichuk. He's the botanist from the University of Michigan with Ed Boss, published Michigan Flora. And I hear him out, look what I got, look what I got. And he's all excited. He's got Vaccinium cespitosum. Cecil Billington in 1949 listed this plant for Michigan, but he had no vulture specimens, no proof that it existed here. In 1982, Tony found this plant. And now it can be documented as an actual plant made of Michigan. And interesting, I said, Tony, look what I got. I got a current blue butterfly. And I called him O'Neill, so he said, no, you don't. He said, there's no lupin up there. He said, check and see if it's northern blue. I said, well, what's a northern blue? Well, it was a butterfly not known in Michigan. Actually, Mo had found one specimen or two specimens, I think, maybe on olive oil. And it just wasn't known in the winter. Well, I found a large breeding colony in that same area where Tony found that plant. And it was a northern blue, and I examined minute little differences that make it virtually look the same, but it was a different species uh, from what I originally thought it was. And interestingly enough, I'll go back to a second. Interestingly enough, the DNR uh, listed both that plant and the butterfly as state threatened species. And then they gave me a grant to do life history work on this butterfly. And as it turns out, the caterpillar of this butterfly feeds on vaccinium cespitosum. We found two new species of, in Michigan that were related to one another in one way or another. Very exciting stuff. But we don't know what's out there in the wilderness. We don't know what's wild and free and natural that, unless we protect these areas and then thoroughly investigate them. Wilderness for wildlife, where we can find all kinds of things natural for recreation, for the wonders and joys, where we can wander about. Um, I think that's it. Is that Capital Reef tune? Yeah, it's Capital Reef. I was going to say maybe it's Zion, because uh, one of my friends here is uh, considering going to Zion. is one of our favorite places, but also is Capital Reef. And so, wilderness for recreation. On the edges of wilderness, we can make a living. We can use the land in some way or another that supports us, but the world can't support us if we don't support it. And so who knows what's in the chemicals in these plants. Our history is tied to the wilderness areas. We don't want our future to look like this. We want our future to maintain healthy and living. So the wilderness for wildlife is very critical. Wilderness for recreation, which we utilize, wilderness for science, which will support us and also help us understand how the natural world works, and wilderness for the wildlife themselves among the most important. So I'm gonna close with another piece by Aldo Leopold. He calls thinking, Thinking like a mountain is a piece that Elder Leopold wrote in the upshot, upshot of a San Antonio Almanac. And he states, <clears throat> a deep, chesty brawl echoes from rim rock to rim rock, rolls down the mountain, and fades into the far blackness of the night. It is an outburst of wild, defiant sorrow and of contempt for all the adversities of the world, every living thing, and perhaps many a dead one as well, pays heed to that call. To the deer, it is a reminder of the way of all flesh. To the pine, the forecast of midnight scuffles. To the cowman, the threat of red ink at the bank. To the hunter, the challenge of the fang against bullet. But beyond this obvious, uh, hopes and fears, there lies a deeper meaning known only to the mountain. Only the mountain has lived long enough 
to listen objectively to the howl of the wolf or the fact that mountains, mountains have a secret opinion about them. My own conviction on this score dates from the day that I saw a wolf die. We were eating lunch on a high rim rock, at the foot of which a turbulent river elbowed its way. We saw what we thought was a doe fording the torrent, her breast washing white water. When she climbed the bank and shook out her tail, we realized our error. It was a wolf. A half dozen others, evidently grown pups, sprang from the willows and all joined in the welcome melee of the playful mollies and wagging tails. What was literally a pile of wolves reed and tumbled in the open flat at the base of our rim rock. In those days, we had never heard the chance to missing the chance of killing a wolf. With more excitement than accuracy, aiming a steep downhill shot is always difficult. When our rifles were empty, the wolf was down. And a pump was dragging the leg into impassable slide rocks. I reached that old wolf in time to watch the fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, and I've known ever since, that there was something new in me in those eyes, something known only to the mountain and to the wolf. I was young then, I was full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves meant hunter's paradise. And after seeing the green fire die, I realized neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with my view. I was young then, I was full of trigger edge. I thought because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves meant harsh paradise. And after seeing that green fire die, I realized neither the wolf more than about agreed with my view. Thank you for hearing me in that. The effort to preserve wilderness throughout the continent and actually take a part in protecting the eight and a half million acres of the Red Rock Wilderness across Southern Utah. Um, that area is so critical <clears throat> for a healthy future. And we all need to take a part and hopefully we can get Peter Meyer to sign on to protecting that. Our senators both are already supporting it and uh, signing that. So let's hope we can help get this legislation through. We're done.